Hello, welcome to Property Law 101. I'm Sarah Bronin and I created this series so that you could help understand, to help you understand rather, the basics of property law. Uh, we cover four questions in this series, very fundamental questions to property itself. And today we are covering the question of how you acquire property. There are four main roots of title that we're focusing on. And we talked a little bit about those in video seven. They are discovery, first possession, creation, and labor. Uh, these are uh, all important, but we spend the most time on possession. And today we are talking about first possession in water. So water, it's something that we need every day. If you look back to the history of our country, uh, the access to water and the way that property law allocated water was essential to determining how our country developed and where we developed. If people couldn't have private property interests in water, uh, our country would have been very different. So I just wanted to keep that history in mind and thinking about why, how we privatize water rights and, and what we're talking about today, which is property rights in water courses specifically. So sometimes we call water courses surface water. They're really uh, streams and rivers, things that can be used uh, for transportation. In the past, uh, when we had mill buildings running off of hydropower, uh, riverways were essential to the functioning of industry. They uh, uh, water our crops. They are a source of recreation. And of course, they are a source of uh, drinking water. So America in law has uh, really divided uh, property rights in surface water in two basic ways. So the first uh, is what we call riparian rights. And we see these most often in states in the East. What we see in those cases uh, is a, a view that there's natural use and that riparian owners, so riparian owners are those who have property right next to a river or a, a stream and a water course, um, that, that those riparian owners have certain rights. So natural uses uh, that are protected by states that recognize riparian rights are those household uses, like domestic uses, things that you would need to eat and drink. The second category of uses within uh, riparian rights are artificial uses. So this might be irrigation, propelling machinery, and other non-domestic uses. And each riparian owner can use uh, uh, water as long as that use is reasonable. So you have these two different kinds of uses, uh, preference for the natural uses uh, when it comes to the kind of water rights uh, a riparian owner has. And then you have this idea that there is a reasonable, reasonableness standard. You can't prevent one party from damaging another party without paying for it. The second standard that developed in uh, water rights law and in American allocations of water uh, rights in water courses is the prior appropriation rule. So this rule is more typical out west. Um, it is more appropriate for western lands because the climate is drier. Uh, irrigation is a necessity for um, most human settlements. It is no longer, therefore, an artificial use to irrigate. It's a natural use. So when you think about prior appropriation, what you're doing is uh, encouraging uh, agriculture, encouraging this uh, first in time. So, for, so prior appropriation is a first in time, first in right idea where whoever is using the water first uh, gets uh, its extended use. So again, this might make sense in the West where you want to encourage people to cultivate land and to use uh, the water that they need to do so and to protect water rights in an area of the country that was uh, slower or later to develop than, uh, than the East. So there's, an, 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 again, an, an view in the West that this prior appropriation, get as much as you need, uh, first in time, first in right, uh, is a better way to go than the riparian reasonable rights rule of the East. So th neither the prior appropriation rule nor the riparian rights rule is perfect. And I'll just give you a few uh, examples of this or a few reasons why. Uh, the first is that neither encourages the conservation of uh, resources. 
uh, of water specifically, and neither has a particularly good way of responding to droughts. So if you are in a prior appropriation regime, you actually have an incentive to keep using the water that you initially, you had an initial entitlement to, uh, keep at least showing that you're using it by, uh, by, by spraying it over crops or maybe spraying it in an area that might not need irrigation because it's use it or lose it. You don't have uh, the ability to just not, not, use, uh, not use it. Similarly, the riparian method or the riparian uh, allocation of water ownership might result in what you might consider bowling area frontages. So uh, having uh, riparian owners have access to a river simply by having a very small stretch of land along that river. So again, we call this bowling, bowling rights, uh, uh, sorry, bowling alley uh, access to a river. So you have uh, prior appropriation, which encourages uh, premature grabbing and encourages wasting. You have riparian rights, which pushes people uh, to do some funny things with property along the river. And between the two of them, it's not clear that, that either of them is, is perfect in, in allocating rights to our precious resource. Yet nonetheless, it's important for you to know both of them uh, because they both manage uh, water rights across the country. And because both of these concepts, prior appropriation and reasonable use are important in other areas of law, both natural resources law and other types of law that we'll be talking about in other videos in this series. So keep those two concepts in mind. I'm gonna leave it there. And I encourage you to be in touch with me uh, on Twitter, on uh, 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 through my website, sign up for my mailing list. I'd love to hear from you and I will uh, see you next time. So thanks a lot.